In this video, we're going to be talking about the Roman Empire all the way back from the foundations of Rome and theories on the foundation of Rome. And then we'll move on to the fall of the Western Roman Empire. So looking at the foundations of Rome, you can see where Rome is on the map there. And we're going to specifically be talking about the city of Rome and, and where does it get its foundations. In mythology, it's said that Romulus founded Rome. Uh, this story comes from uh, the myth of Romulus and Rebus. The, they were two brothers who were uh, raised by a, a wolf, uh, supposedly, and uh, uh, you know, a, a, and grew up that way. And eventually, they fight each other. Romulus kills Rebus. It goes on to, to found the city of Rome. Closer to actuality, it's believed that there was a settlement that popped up on Palatine Hill around 1000 BC. Uh, so that's the, more of the historical rather than the mythological. Early Rome was influenced by neighbors such as Greece uh, and the uh, Etruscans who, who were in the region of Italy there. Uh, the Latin language, which will become the language of Rome, was heavily influenced by Greek, for example, um, along with some other native languages in Italy. Uh, the alphabet comes from the Phaetians that we talked about in one of the earlier videos, uh, training people. And uh, perhaps most importantly from Greece, Rome takes Greek polytheism and, and this idea of multiple gods, takes those gods and renames them. Uh, the Olympics, for example, will still be practiced when Rome eventually conquers Greece. So, uh, a lot of correlation to Greece that we just talked about. Early on in Rome, there was a king of Rome uh, who was elected for life, uh, and he also had a senate, but they were primarily advisors. It was 300 advisors. advisors. Uh, they didn't really control anything. It's kind of like the cabinet today advises the, the president, um, where the president makes all the executive decisions. It was comparable to that uh, in, in early Rome. Tarquin was the last king of Rome. Uh, he was sent to exile by the Senate. The Senate, even though they didn't have any real power, eventually kind of rose to this power and uh, it expelled Tarquin. And the reason for this uh, is in a writing called, well, it's documented in a writing called the Rape of Lucretia. And the story about that goes is that Tarquin's son uh, was involved in, in, in raping this noble woman, um, Lucretia. Uh, and, and it because it was a, a noble family, there was a little bit of, you know, essentially kind of a coup d'etat by the Senate to overthrow the king, because this was his son who, who did this. Um, so when that happens, the Roman Republic is actually founded, and that's where we're getting to, uh, you know, probably more of the, the lasting contributions of Rome. So the Roman Republic was founded in 509 B.C., uh, and had a very complex government. Uh, today, the United States government is influenced by the Roman Republic. The, the founding fathers would have uh, looked at that, for example. Um, the British government also takes a lot of uh, influence from Rome. Uh, but it's important to remember, even that the idea of a republic is that you have equality, uh, women didn't have any rights in, in ancient Rome. Um, and you also had strife between what they called the patricians and the plebeians. The patricians would have been more of the upper class, kind of the nobility, and the majority of people would have been the plebeians, that's the, the lower class in, in Rome. Uh, the Roman Republic, or in Rome, you have what they call the Twelve Tables, which is kind of a foundation of Roman law. That's something to remember about Rome. As far as the, the different um, makeup uh, uh, of the way the Roman Republic worked, this is a very brief overview. You have the councils, the Senate, and the Plebeian Council. Um, so the councils are going to be two guys early on who kind of balance each other out. They're kind of like the executive branch. Uh, make sure no one has too much power that they can't, or they can veto each other and stuff like that. They keep each other in check. 
the Senate is made up of the nobility still, uh, and then the or the patricians, and then the, there was the plebeian council who didn't have a lot of power, but they you know uh, you know gave a lot of advice and had their voice heard. The tribunes kind of uh, uh, make the will of plebeian council known, so that's their role. Additionally, you have governors and, and such that, that rule the different provinces. You have others who, who act kind of like mayors and people that take uh, the census and stuff like that. Uh, during the time of the Roman Republic, there's what like there's three wars called the Puma, uh, Punic Wars, uh, where Rome battled against Carthage. We talked about Carthage being founded uh, early on by by the Phoenicians, kind of uh, as a trading city, and they popped up as their own civilization. Carthage ends up going to war with Rome. So very briefly, we're going to look at some of the highlights. Uh, in the first war. Um, Rome accused Carthage of breaking a treaty, uh, and they declare war over Sicily. Um, as a result of the war, Rome won the war and took Sicily, uh, and Carthage had to pay a fine and give up control of Sicily. Uh, in the second war, Hannibal kind of gets revenge. He takes an army of elephants into Rome, uh, but Carthage does eventually have to surrender because the Romans counterattacked. And then the Third Punic Wars, uh, they're act the Romans actually going to take control of Carthage. So we're going to talk about the Roman Empire, which comes into existence out of the Roman Republic and how that happens. So the fall of the Roman Republic began in five or 59 BC, you have the, uh, I always struggle with this word, Trumpiverite, <laughs> you see the word there, there's some of these Latin words I'm just going to struggle with, but it was made up of Caesar, Pompey, and uh, Crassius, uh, the three of them uh, uh, were, were kind of replaced the council, so remember the council was two, this is going to be three, uh, in, in the first uh, group of three that they have. Uh, Caesar and Pompey went to war after Crassius died, uh, so you have a civil war in, in Rome. Caesar wins this war because what happens is he, he's out fighting uh, with his army in Gaul, which is modern-day France, and he brings his army across the Rubicon River, which was the border of Italy. And the way Roman law was written was that a general could not bring their army assembled past the Rubicon, and the reason for that was was to make sure that the Senate couldn't be overthrown. They didn't want a general or anyone like that, which Caesar was a general, to have too much control, and if you take your army and you could overthrow the government, even if you are, you know, part of the executive branch, essentially. Um, legally, no, but he was acting as such, and it is this switch from council to uh, tribunal right that takes place. Um, so anyway, so, so Caesar ends up winning this war that's waged when he crossed the Rubicon. There's a famous quote there about the die has been cast. Um, you know, essentially whatever happens, happens. And, and Caesar ends up uh, becoming essentially the, the, the sole leader of Rome when he defeats Pompey. Uh, Caesar gained so much power, he was assassinated by the Senate. He, that uh, assassination is led by a guy named Brutus, uh, and the Senate kills Caesar. Unfortunately, that didn't last too long because there's a second group of three that pops up. Uh, Mark Anthony Octavian, who is a, a family member of Julius Caesar, and Lepidus, uh, same thing, you're going to get down to... Uh, a group of two there when, when Levitus is removed by Octavian from power in 36 BC, you have a second civil war between Mark Anthony and Octavian. Mark Anthony is going to get help from Cleopatra, and I told you we, we would talk about uh, uh, Egypt and why that was important. Cleopatra is a descendant of, of the of Greek, uh, um, you know, 
a ruling class that, that was in Egypt after Alexander the Great. And Cleopatra has a fairly strong military. So Oct or Ant Mark Anthony uh, ends up allying Cleopatra to try to beat Octavian, who was the dominant force in Rome. Interestingly enough, um, Cleopatra had birthed Caesar's child, which is inter just fun fact. But anyway, Mark Anthony and Cleopatra defeated in the Battle of Actium. That was a naval battle. Um, that was in 31 BC, and essentially um, Octavian comes to full control. Um, Cleopatra and Mark Anthony commit suicide uh, by snake, the story goes. Uh, anyway. And so Cleopatra was the last um, pharaoh of Egypt in that way because it becomes part of the Roman Empire um, fully. Octavian gave himself the title Augustus. He never claimed to be emperor, though most historians regard him as being the first Roman emperor. And in reality, he essentially acted as such, you know, as the power he controlled. Uh, he ruled between 27 BC and 40 AD. So like we said, Octavian was the first um, real Roman Caesar, and so I put this slide in here just to talk about in detail some of the contributions of Greece, what was go or, or Rome, rather, what was going on uh, between Octavian and kind of the decline of Rome later on that we're going to talk about. Well, Rome is going to expand into new lands. They're going to go into Greece. So that's going to be written on another slide there. Eventually, you're going to have later on pharaohs, you're, you're going to have several, or not pharaohs, uh, emperors, uh, you're, you're going to have several emperors after uh, Octavian, who changed his name to Augustus Caesar, um, for example, you'll have, um, uh, you know, Caligula is going to be a famous one, Nero, um, you know, several others, there we could do an entire, you know, video on, on Roman emperors. Um, but anyway, the Roman Empire expanded uh, its lands. Like I said, eventually it will expand into Britain. That's going to be much later on. Um, the, the Caligula kind of does some of that with what there's this thing about him attacking the sea. And it's kind of funny if you ever get a chance to research it. But anyway... Rome expands in this period called the Pax Romana, which is Latin for peace of Rome. And the reason for that is Rome controlled so much land that all in all, the world was at peace for quite a while. Um, public product or public projects took place, such as building aqueducts. That's where you can uh, transport water. That was important, right? Sewage is going to be uh, important to Roman cities. They're going to build a lot of walls in Roman cities, like Hadrian's Wall, and it's going to be in England to divide Scotland and England later on to keep the, the Scottish out. Uh, domes were used in a lot of building projects. That was an invention of, of Rome. Um, and, then, and then roads are going to unite the empire as well. That's really important. Uh, there's going to be a lot of entertainment in Roman times as well. We're going to have gladiator fights like in the um, Colosseum there early on. You have chariot races. Theater was common. That's something they kind of adopted from Greece. And so a lot of – it was fairly nice to live in the Roman Empire, especially as what we've seen before in the ancient world. Um, things to enjoy, things to make your life better. This was just a, a picture I added in later on. Actually, I wanted to show you what the map or what the roads would have looked like. This isn't a great picture because the map is kind of boxed and not what it actually looks like. But you, you can see um, like here you have Italy down here and you have France there and Spain and England up here. And you see... Um, you, you see the way that the roads connected the empire. You have trade routes here and such, and, you know, you could jump. Essentially, you're going around the circle, right? You could go all the way from up here where, where uh, in England, and you could go to uh, Byzantinium over here, which will become Constantinople later on, and you could travel around through uh, Israel. Damascus is there. 
You could go to Carthage up here, and you could cross back over into Spain, which was called Hispaniola, and go back to England through Gaul, which is modern France. So, you know, you, you can make an entire loop the way that, that their system was set up. Um, this There wasn't ever a bridge here. This was, you would have taken a boat here and here. Uh, but anyway, uh, so you see this vast transportation system that revolutionized the Roman world. So we're going to look at Christianity, which pops up uh, during Roman times. So we'll take a, a bit of a break, I guess, between the, the Roman Caesars and such. We'll pick back up with them on the next slide, um, but talking a little about, about uh, Christianity, which... Um, like I said, pops up in, in, in the Roman province of Judea that we just looked at on that other map. So around 1 AD, there's some debate. Maybe it was 5 BC, 4 BC, somewhere around 1 AD. Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth was born. Uh, he grew up Jewish, so he would have practiced Judaism in the Roman, Roman province of Judea. And Jesus claimed to be the Christ, which was important, which is uh, a, a Greek term for Messiah. Uh, and in Judaism, uh, the the Jews were waiting for this Messiah to come. And the m major interpretation at that time was that God would send someone to liberate the Jewish people. Well, Jesus claimed to be this Messiah. Uh, but Christians, Christianity is going to emerge. Jesus is going to amass this following around 30 AD when he really starts teaching um, with this idea that the kingdom of God was at hand, the idea that it's not so much about overthrowing Rome, uh, but it's about God saving humanity from their sins, and not just the Jews, but the rest of the world as well. And so it's a major shift in the theology, the, the ideas about God for, for Jews, and essentially historians regard this as entirely religion. Christianity pops up. This idea that Jesus is the Messiah. Not only that, Jesus claimed to be the Son of God and to be equal with God, that he was God himself. Um, and according to the Bible, he came from a virgin birth. Uh, so the idea that Jesus is fully man and fully God. Jesus was crucified on the charge of essentially public disorder um, by Pontius Pilate, who was the Roman governor of Judea uh, in the 3rd century. And according to the Bible, Jesus resurrected from the dead three days after his crucifixion uh, in order to save humanity from their sins. This is known as substitutionary atonement by many Christian sects or denominations, and it's the way of God giving grace to those who have faith in Jesus. Early on, Christians were persecuted for the beliefs in the Roman Empire, and then around 300 AD, uh, Emperor Constantine converted to Christianity and sponsored the Council of Nicaea. That was in the 3rd century. I think I made a mistake, actually. It was the 3rd decade that Pontius Pilate, so 30s AD, that Pontius Pilate was a uh, governor of, of Judea, but it was in the 3rd century AD that Constantine will convert to Christianity and it will become legal within the Roman Empire. And about 100 years after that, it's going to become the official religion of the Roman Empire. So looking at some Bible verses, this is kind of our primary source here on where Christians early on would have taken their, uh, or in the Roman Empire early on, would have taken their idea about Jesus being the Messiah um, from Isaiah 53, which was written uh, about seven centuries before the first century AD. And this is the idea of a prophecy in Judaism, Messiah's coming and, and what will happened to him, and so he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, so this idea that Jesus is the coming Messiah is, is key to uh, Christianity. Additionally, then you have this idea of the foundations of Christianity is that uh, it, we see in John 3.16, such a famous passage there. Uh, kind of foundations of, of Christianity. 
So our last slide, we're going to look at the decline and the fall of Rome, what took place there, and what did it look like. Uh, in 117 AD, Rome had conquered lands as far away as Britain. But slowly and over time, Rome began to decline from civil wars, corrupt politicians, and invasions. There's also this idea that Rome had essentially become so big that it couldn't even support itself. It essentially collapsed under its own size. It had become so large during the Pax Romana, the, the Peace of Rome, that the government simply couldn't rule everywhere and keep control of everywhere. So as a result, the large size of the Roman Empire and these concerns, Emperor Diocletian divided the empire into two in 285 AD. Uh, this division doesn't last. They end up being united, then they divide into three, then they unite again. Eventually, they stay divided in two around 395 AD. In 410 AD, the city of Rome was attacked by a Germanic tribe known as the Visigoths. Uh, so that's only even weakened essentially the city of Rome, specifically even more so. In 476 AD, the city of Rome fell, uh, you know, kind of had a final fall, led by a Germanic tribe um, by Odasser, who becomes, he crowns himself king of Italy, and the Western Roman Empire falls at this time, uh, according to most historians. So that would have been the area in blue, and you even see here that, that this entire area of Spain and much of France and such, that there's no blue, and the reason is these areas would have already rebelled by this point of 476 or around that time. Uh, they would have already rebelled, and Rome didn't have control over them. They still control, um, you know, around here like Normandy and such in France. Uh, they would have still controlled in the north of Africa a little bit. Uh, Italy uh, and such, but Western Rome is really on the decline. Now you see Eastern Rome, which is over here, stays intact, and like I said, they lose a lot of land every time, but they will remain until 1453 AD. That's called, or goes on to be called the Byzantine Empire. Everyone that lived there would have considered themselves Roman. It was the Eastern Roman Empire, even though the West had fallen. Uh, and we'll pick back up with them uh, much later on. We'll, we'll talk about them in the medieval world. In the next video, we're going to be going back to the beginning of time where we talked about Mesopotamia and river valleys. We're going to be talking about river valleys in India uh, and then on up through the Classical Age. This is called the Classical Age with Rome. Uh, you have four major classical civilizations, Greece, Rome. Um, you have... India and China. So we're going to talk all the way in the next video from the river valleys up to classical India. Then we're going to do the same with China, talk about river valleys through classical China. After that, we'll talk a little bit about what was going on in Africa during all this time. Um, we'll talk about Islam and how that spreads into Africa. And then we'll talk about Byzantinium. We'll go back to see what's happening in Rome and their interactions with the Islamic world. So that's kind of the, the plan out of the videos after this. So the next video will be going all the way back to the beginning in Asia.